We're considering Jacqueline Mellet's account of Lacan's earliest pre-psychoanalytic, going into psychoanalytic work. And we're doing that to try and explore some of the potential phenomenological origins of certain ideas in, in Lacan's work. So we'll be staying with this text, reading seminars one and two, the opening chapters that Jacqueline Miller writes or spoke and then were transcribed. And uh, we'll highlight a couple of important points. We'll draw on Sartre, we'll draw on, um, on, on, on Heidegger. So uh, on the ninth page of this text, Jacqueline Miller emphasizes, it's important to grasp Lacan's perspective in his work on the case study in his thesis is that of phenomenological psychiatry. So there it is. You can say that Lacan's, in his origins, is a piece of work that is squarely within the remit of uh, phenomenological psychiatry. Um, as we turn the page, Miller is gonna draw our attention to, to some other ideas that prove very crucial and instructive. He wants to stress by way of doing that, that the whole phenomenological standpoint had, as he puts it, a seminal influence on the 20th century. Running counter to science, objective point of view, phenomenology strove to develop a rigorous philosophy of subjectivity. Then he moves on and he speaks a little bit about Heidegger. And I suppose we should just make this obvious qualification that there's going to be a number of moments in Lacanian theory where we can trace the influence of key philosophers, philosophical forms of thought. That in itself doesn't necessarily mean that phenomenology, phenomenology is alive and well in Lacan, clearly not. But you could argue that many of the ideas that find their way through a kind of extrapolative, extrapolating influence in, in Lacan's work do come from the domain of phenomenological philosophers. So in that sense, that it, you can say that there is a, there's an influence. So, uh, Miller speaks quickly, briefly about Jaspers. He says, Jaspers brought to psychiatry an interest in the meaning of madness, taking into account the language spoken by the subject, and so on. Lacan explicitly refers to Jaspers in his thesis. And then Miller goes on to talk about Heidegger. He stresses, as many of us know, that Heidegger's work stems from that of Husserl's. And then he says, Heidegger defined what he called not man or human being, but rather man's being in the world. This is not pure consciousness. It is always in a worldly context with a certain perspective. That is, there are always things he does not see, but which are nevertheless around him. As a being in the world, man has a project. That is, a sense of the future, something they, I should say, want to do. Thus, humans project their life from the point of view into the future. This important existential, or let's say phenomenological concept of the project is something that will prove crucial to Lacan. Now, when one hears those words, being in the world, and of course, in another way, being unto death, and this idea of projecting one into the future, one should immediately be aware of Lacanian clinical techniques, such as that of the ending of a session, scansion. One could argue that in those moments, those moments are also, maybe in a kind of micro way, locating the subject in relationship to a kind of existential moment of what will come next, of what their futurity might be. So that's just one little possible point of inspiration, but there's else to, more to say about that. Continuing on the topic of Heidegger, uh, Miller says, in Heidegger's writings, one comes upon the idea that humans being connected to the environment and to the future are always projecting outside of themselves. What Heidegger called Dasein is not an interiority. Heidegger denies the existence of humans uh, not as interiority and an inner something like ideas or feelings, but rather as a constant projecting outside. Sorry, maybe I gave the wrong impression there. So there is a, a denial of the idea that human subjectivity can be reduced to an interiority. Now, that's kind of a, an interesting claim because you could say through certain traditions within psychoanalysis, that idea of an, an interiority to which a subject can in some ways be reduced is pretty important. So taking on this influence of Heidegger is going to give us a somewhat different approach to what we might think of as the subject of psychoanalysis. So to reiterate, there is um, uh, not so much of an interiority, an inner something, but rather a constant projecting outside in Heidegger. Uh, 
Heidegger himself invented the notion of existence, existence, but with the ex hyphenated, existence. Um, <clears throat> and Lacan takes this up. Heidegger himself invented the distinction between existence and insistence. And having no interiority, one thus projects outside, and this repeats itself. Lacan's wordplay on l'instance de la lettre, apologies for the attempted French, the instance of the letter, and of course it's the famous écrit in, um, in, in écrit, this idea of the instance, meaning agency or insistence of the letter, stems from Heidegger. So we've got a couple of points of indebtedness or inspiration. One is the idea of existence, of a kind of existing from outside rather than existing from within. We've also got the idea of a kind of repetitive insistence, which Lacan wants to also take up, a repetitive insistence in the signifier, in the signifying chain in language itself. But also this kind of idea that human subjectivity cannot be reduced to an interiority. Uh, and also the idea that there's a, a projection forward into, into a future. Having noted a few of those little moments, let's also now turn to Sartre. And that's, of course, exactly what Jacqueline Millet does. Sartre, he says, we're on page 10 of the text, radicalized Heidegger's point of view by saying that, fundamentally speaking, consciousness is nothing. If we take Heidegger seriously when he says that humans are always outside of themselves, we can simplify it by saying that consciousness is nothing. Consciousness is nothing more than a movement of intentionality towards the outside. Consciousness is nothing. Now, of course, this is a hugely significant idea in Sartre, really important in, in the history of philosophy, and it comes in being a nothingness. And we can see how Lacan, despite his often vociferous rejections of existentialism, is going to be influenced by this idea. He's not, of course, interested in consciousness, but he is interested in the unconscious. But let's go back to Jacqueline Miller. This idea that consciousness is nothing, nothing more than a movement of intentionality towards the outside, all very phenomenological ideas, this is being and nothingness in a nutshell. Sartre goes so far as to define consciousness as nothing, yet connected to intentionality. In defining consciousness, Sartre himself uses the expression lack of being, le manque d'être, sorry again for French, that Lacan recasts as manque à être. It's difficult to translate into English, but Lacan translated it as want to be. So lack in being, uh, wanting to be, lack as the self, as subject, um, personified lack, lack itself. We have then a nice uh, lineage or ancestry of a key Lacanian idea. Although, of course, you could say that the Lacanian emphasis is, is often on lack as simply as nothingness. But the Lacanian subject in its formulation as lackingness, as wantingness, of course, you can also detect Freud there, right? Wantingness, desirousness, wishingness. But we could say that that very fundamental and important Lacanian conceptualization of the subject is thereby in some ways indebted to the nothingness that is prioritized by Sartre. Miller then goes on to re-foreground phenomenology and he says the following, page 11. Phenomenology was of capital importance to Lacan as it introduced anti-objectivism. Lacan, in a sense, transferred many phenomenological considerations to the unconscious. It was essential to him that the unconscious not be taken as an interiority or as a container in which some drives are found over on one side and a few identifications over on the other. Uh, and these being associated with the belief that a little analysis might help clean up the container antithetical ideas from Lacan's perspective. He took the unconscious not as a container, but rather as something existent, something as of outside the self that is connected to a subject who is lack of being. So it's tempting to just want to read that paragraph again, because there seems to be so many important things. About anti-objectivism, you find in, in Lacan's early 30s writings, this constant critique of the psychological and psychology as a discipline for him is always gravitating either to notions of objectivity or to objects. And of course, even we hear an echo here of his somewhat muted response to the idea of id, ego, and superego. And of course, let me qualify as Freudian concepts, they're obviously bread and butter to Lacan and he works with them and he needs them. But what he doesn't like is if they are somehow implicitly reduced to objects. So 
Lacanian psychoanalysis, and the, the key moment here, presumably, is how he thinks the unconscious. Remember, for him, the status of the unconscious is not ontological. It's not a thing. It's rather ethical. In other words, it's something that has to do with subjectivity and how subjectivity may be reformed or, or, or transformed or, or changed within the ethical domain of clinical psychoanalysis itself. But not to put too fine a point on it, Lacan doesn't like the whole idea of objects. Objects are within the imaginary domain to him. He's very opposed to thinking a psychology that always wants to have objects, measurable objects, objects of knowledge, objects of psychical understanding. So this moment, and of course, just to put the dots together here, the crucial moment in phenomenology is that consciousness is not an object. Consciousness cannot be fixed as an object. Consciousness is not objectal, like things in the world are objects. Why? Because it's fundamentally intentional, it's fundamentally directed to the world and perceptual experiences and so on. So that anti-objectivism, and Miller makes a great point here, is inherited by Lacan, and he inherits it both to do a critique of what he understands the residual and constant objectivism of psychology, and as a way of saying that when we think about the unconscious, we should think about it as a verb, as a doing, uh, as an opening, not as a storehouse, a container, and most fundamentally not as an object. So I've tried to, to make that point um, uh, all the way down here in point number eight. Just as consciousness cannot be understood as object, so the unconscious cannot be viewed as a substance, as an object, as a container. Back though to Jacqueline Miller, from page 12. What distinguished Lacan from phenomenologists right from the outset in his thesis was that whereas he took meaning to be fundamental in psychiatry and psychoanalysis, he also stressed the importance of seeking the laws of meaning. Now, this might help us uh, further develop some of the suggestions we've already made. Meaning as foreground uh, in the descriptive meaning phenomenological experiences of phenomenology and meaning as in the speech of the subject speaking their own uh, psychical experiences of dreams, uh, irrational fantasies, all of that, we see then a kind of commonality. Both psychoanalysis and uh, phenomenology are interested in meaning. But the crucial distinction that is particularly pertinent to Lacan that Miller is emphasizing here is that it's not just meaning. It's meaning and the laws of meaning behind that. And we've gestured to this point several times already by talking about language, symbolic mediation, rather than just direct references to experience. Miller continues, the fact that meaning is grounded in the subject, the fact that meaning is not a thing, does not imply that there are no laws of meaning. All right, so meaning is something we should be engaging with. Or to be slightly more precise in the Canadian terms, not just meaning, but significations, the speech, the utterances, the enunciations of a subject. All of this thing is prime materials, what we should be engaging with. But we are also interested in, hence the influence of structuralism, the laws, the structures that lie behind that. In 1932, Lacan was already studying linguistics to discover the laws of meaning. And true to himself, in the overture of Seminar 1, he stressed it anew, citing Lacan, our task here is to reintroduce the register of meaning, a register that must itself be reintegrated on its own level. In other words, says Miller, his standpoint was still an existential phenomenological one. In 1932, he was explicitly Jasperian or Jasperian. He continues, and this is a great point. For me, this is one that really helps anchor the arguments we're making. He talks about Lacan writing uh, in the volume, the paper on logical time. He became occupied with logical time. Why so? asked Miller. Well, in the logical time paper, we have an experience or actually not simply an experience of time, but a modality of time that is neither simply objective nor simply subjective. That's why it's called logical time. But back to Miller. There is objective time as measured by clocks and subjective time. Time of maintained interest, time to end, which we are rapidly nearing says he as he speaks this seminar, and so on. From a phenomenological point of view, you may distinguish between objective and subjective time. But Lacan doesn't approach subjective time through a description of feelings, which cannot be narrated, 
attempting to grasp the inner feeling of, temper, uh, feeling of temporality, as in poetry, for example, he tries to find the logic of subjective time. So subjective time itself has a logic, a kind of logical sequence. And for those of you who are familiar with the logical time paper and arguments therein, you'll be able to see that. But what I think the easiest way of stressing the point here is to say that Lacan kind of finds a third way. As opposed to objective clock time, and as opposed to the subjective phenomenological experience of time, he wants to suggest that that phenomenological experience of time still has some law, still has some logical sequence to it, and that's logical time. So we're building on this point in a different way. Meaning is fundamental, subjectivity is fundamental, but not simply approached directly with the presumption that it has some unmediated quality to it. There are laws, there are structures which, uh, which condition it. Skipping to the bottom of page 12, Lacan already read Levi-Strauss in 1949. He found what he was looking for, the laws of meaning. Certain aspects of existentialism and phenomenology were completely at odds with structuralism, but Lacan managed to reconcile others. Structuralism taught him that the Husserlian attempt to describe one's immediate intuition of the world, feeling one's own body or being in a perspective, is illusory because language is always already there. Lacan thus rejected the phenomenological illusion of immediacy and realized that the question of the origin of language was not a scientific one, um, the notion of structure undercating, uh, undercutting the search for origins. It, this is a slightly different point, but it goes on. It's interesting. In some sense, there is no origin of structure. We cannot think unless language is already there. Let's just let that reverberate. In some sense, there is no origin of structure because we cannot think of language unless it's already there. I mean, this goes on to a whole different level of critique why uh, Lacan is critical of developmental theories, of developmental theories of language acquisition, because you don't learn one word at a time. You need to have a kind of critical mass of grammatical understandings, even if somewhat implicitly, before language works at all. So this is a point here about there is no origin of structure, but it's also important because it wants to say that language is already there. In other words, by the time there is experience, this is a big claim, phenomenologists might not like that, by the time there is a certain order of experience, you could say that how it starts to be ordered, made sense of, reflected back on, requires language. And maybe we could say, just to be a little bit more uh, precise here, not merely languages and how we would normally understand it, but differential units of meaning or differentiations which are basic to a structuralist understanding of language. So without getting too bogged down in it, another easy way of putting it is that there are structures, there is symbolism, there are symbols, there is language, there are signifiers, and those become very important in how experience is ordered and reflected upon. Okay, let us now quickly note um, a small conclusion here before we, we, we highlight one or two other points from Jacqueline Miller. If we move across now to page 16 of his contributions to this text, we hear Jacqueline Miller saying, In his article, Beyond the Reality Principle, we should bear in mind that the subtitle was A Phenomenological Description of Analytic Experience. Where he mentioned that. Uh, Lacan was thus a phenomenologist when he was a psychiatrist, and he remained a phenomenologist when he was an analyzand trying to present what he referred to as an analytic experience. It's an interesting point that he's a phenomenologist as a psychiatrist and a phenomenologist even when he enters analysis as a patient, stroke analyzant. He doesn't say that he was a phenomenologist once he had become an analyst, but nevertheless. A phenomenological description, Miller says, entails trying to re uh, present what is going on without any preconceptions. It involves the suspension of all preconceived notions and theoretical constructs. You are simply to describe the phenomena as you are experiencing them. However, in adopting this perspective, what Lacan found to, be fundam the f found to be the fundamental datum of analytic experience was, you guessed it, language. And let's end on this quote. In psychoanalysis, you work on the side of what the patient says. This is Lacan reading Freud as Miller describes it to us. In psychoanalysis, you work on the basis of what the patient says. In other words, you do not try to replace what he says with some objective description of his symptoms, as you might do in positivist psychiatry. 
Rather, you listen to the patient's own testimony of their symptom. This is a crucial point in the history of, of psychoanalysis. And it's one that we've, we've highlighted a couple of times. Um, so let's, let's, I know I said that was the last point. We're going to just have one last point and then we really will finish. Lacan's concept of the subject, even before he asserts that the unconscious is structured like a language, is something we need to bear in mind. Okay, And we've tried to note a couple of times the importance of this notion of the subject. That thesis, language, uh, the unconscious is structured like a language, is subordinate to the concept of the subject. The concept of the subject encapsulates much of phenomenology's view of consciousness. So Miller is stressing that there is an important link or an important inheritance in Lacan's uh, the significance that he accords the notion of the subject, given that this is such an important category of phenomenology. But here comes the Lacanian twist, he says. The Lacanian twist is to transfer the phenomenological view of consciousness to the concept of the subject, that is, to the subject of the unconscious. I'm going to emphasize that again. The Lacanian twist here is to transfer the phenomenological view of consciousness. Remember, consciousness uh, is nothingness in art, is uh, intentional, is outside itself, to the subject of the unconscious. What phenomenologists like Husserl and his French pupils Sartre and Merleau-Ponty developed through their concept of consciousness was the fundamental anti-objectivist or non-objectivist status of consciousness. They stressed the fact that consciousness is not an object in the world and that you must not describe or analyze self-consciousness with the same categories that you use to describe objects in the world. And of course, you could say that's exactly the move that Lacan wants to make, not in view of how he thinks consciousness, but in terms of how he wants to think the unconscious.